My name is Stefan Molyneux. I'm the host of Free Domain Radio. I um, did get a little bit of education, God help me. I have a master's degree in history, focusing really on the history of philosophy from the University of Toronto. Uh, I studied playwriting and acting at theater school, and uh, I spent about 15 years in the entrepreneurial world and then started broadcasting during a fairly long commute. Well, not really broadcasting, recording. And then I guess six or so years ago, went uh, full time to rely on uh, uh, the tin cup of internet donation begging uh, as the source of my income. And uh, I've really, really enjoyed the process. Um, we're doing about 40 to 50 million downloads as a whole, uh, over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, 20 million video downloads. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a fantastic ride. Uh, I certainly appreciate everybody who's donated. And uh, I've really uh, enjoyed a lot of the, the films that you've uh, put out, Peter. I'm just working my way through culture. Uh, in Decline, which I think I would absolutely agree with the title, uh, and um, I've really enjoyed uh, the work and effort. Uh, I've been working on a little documentary myself, and you know, when <laughs> anytime you feel like criticizing somebody else, just try walking a mile in the shoes they've walked in, and it gives you a kind of humility because it is a long and challenging process. So, um, uh, so if you'd like to introduce yourself to my audience, I'm sure uh, most of my uh, people know you, but uh, for those who don't, uh, sure. Well, plus, well, I'd, I'd like to point out, though, of course, before we begin that. You know, there's a, a tendency to become polarized in discussion, and we use this subject of debate, you know, has been rolling around the internet. And I'm really fascinated by your work. I want to say that uh, I'm really impressed. I never was familiar with your philosophical dispositions and the extent of what you understand. I really want to commend you on uh, your ability to basically take really complex social subjects and reduce them down into a digestible form for the general public. Uh, so that said, my name is Peter Joseph Stalin. I am a New World Order neo-Marxist communist Satanist who, when not trying to get his beard to look as much like Vladimir Lenin uh, or dress like Mao Zedong, am busy programming robots to speak in fluent, arrogant, anti-capitalistic Marxist dialect uh, as I work towards my final solution, which is the installation of an all-seeing, all-knowing global supercomputer that will rule humanity by a rigid collectivist calculation that will bring about a true socialist utopia that will end all human freedom and liberty forever. That joke aside, uh, my name is Peter Joseph, and uh, I grew up as a musician. I was very fortunate to go to an art school, which broke my indoctrination. I was, I was uh, very serious about classical performance, a very highly intellectualized 20th century music advocate. I began my interest in economics, which is the most pertinent point with this conversation, and philosophy by extension, of course, or by root extension, in about 2002, where I began to become fascinated with equity trading and the equity markets. I spent about seven years as a private equity trader, coupled with basic entrepreneurship, running my own production company, and being, of course, a laborer and freelancer in the communicative arts, being mainly video and, uh, and uh, audio production for commercials or various social media. So, uh, well, not social media, but commercial media, I should say. So that's where my home is. And during the course of this development, I began to recognize that there's something deeply flawed in the fundamental principles of what we have going on in the world today. There's a decoupling, and I would say an out-of-dated type of referent, what people keep perpetuating the same type of traditionalism over and over and over again, and they don't seem to realize, even though they think they're doing something new, they think they're applying new concepts, they think they see a path towards resolution and change, they're just running in place because they haven't realized that, in my view, the current economic system and its fundamental predication is inherently flawed and really can't be altered until you transcend the market system by its foundational ethic entirely. So I'm, uh, you know, the, the problem isn't, the problem with, I think, when we have these discussions, when I think about what you advocate, is that it's so homogeneous with the current system. It's antiquated with respect to the current needs and capacity of the world, and the very principles you put forward simply do not have the mechanics to achieve such revolutionary ends. And I completely agree with your ends. I couldn't agree with your value system more so. Uh, and I can start to jump into these types of philosophical fallacies whenever you like. Well, we, we were going to start and let's, I think, take a swing at that at the market system. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. And uh, I'm going to give just a few minutes because it's, it's, it's a huge topic, obviously, but uh, hopefully we can boil it down to a couple of principles that I think are important. The first principle, of course, is whenever you start talking about the market system, you have to make sure that people understand that it is not what is currently surrounding us and 
preying upon us like a pterodactyl vampire jackal on the very jugular of humanity and the spines of the children's future. So uh, what we have right now is a very predatory fascistic style model for the most part in the West. Uh, there are uh, three, I think, three major areas where state control is um, absolute or close to absolute. Uh, the first, of course, is that the government controls money. And by here, I'm, I'm talking about most of the world, but in particular the West and in particular America. Government controls uh, the money supply through the congressionally uh, appointed, though never uh, oversighted, uh, Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve controls the money supply. The government has significant influence, if not outright control, over the, uh, the interest rates. And whenever you have the government controlling money, then whatever is left over is like just a vestige of the free market. The free market fundamentally uh, relies upon uh, the non-aggression principle and the respect for property rights. And money, of course, is central to almost every transaction uh, in a free market. And if the government controls money, then the government dominates what's left of the free market because all entrepreneurial decisions are made within the context of not knowing what the hell the government is going to do with the money next or the interest rates next, other than a general certainty that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to serve the needs of political masters by printing more and more money for them to hand out like candy to those who support uh, their agenda and wish for the benefits of their power. So, of course, the government controls money, uh, and that is an almost absolute control. There's a little bit of Bitcoin chipping away here and there, but they're facing regulatory review now, uh, and uh, some of them have been shut down, some of the trading exchanges. Uh, there was a guy who came up with the Liberty Dollar, which was a gold-based currency. Uh, I think he's currently uh, in jail, and, of course, you are not allowed to pay your government bills with any currency other than the toilet paper that the government pretends has something to do with real money. So um, governments control money, and uh, through taxation, of course, government controls, um, you know, depending on how you count it, uh, 30, 40, 50, or 60 percent of the wealth in the United States. And uh, through regulation, of course, governments uh, herd things around. There's uh, more subtle things as well in that the stock market, I had some exposure by being um, a director in a company that went public, some exposure to the a swarming herd of angry bees known as the stock market these days doesn't have merely much to do with the original purpose of the stock market. And the reason for that is that billions and billions and billions of dollars are herded into the stock market through government policies uh, that damn well shouldn't be there. And stock market it is designed for knowledgeable people to invest in companies they know something about. But basically, I think in here in Canada, it's called an RSP. I think in America, it's called a 401k. Basically, you have to hand your money over to money managers to invest uh, in government bonds or stocks or, or, or the, the stock market as a whole. And if you don't hand it over to them, the government will, will take it from you by force, all of it. So, uh, so much money is being herded into the stock market that the stock market has become hypercharged, over bloated. There's too much money chasing around, too few profit opportunities, which is distorting decisions that managers make. Uh, in the stock market. So they start really focusing on short-term gain. The inflation, of course, that the government is perpetually, perpetually producing, which is a phenomenon always and forever associated with government control of money, with what's called central banks, which is just another way of saying socialized money. Very different. I mean, in the 19th century, when the, 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 um, the banks were largely private and the gold was, was generally the medium of exchange, or at least the medium that backed money, the prices went down throughout. Can you imagine price, everything being computers, everything going down in price? Well, of course, what happens is when the government prints all this money, creates all this money, types whatever the hell they want into their own bank accounts, what happens is everybody says, well, shit, I, money's losing value. I better spend it, you know, and, and debt is available because debt fuels the whole system. And so you get this rampant consumerism, destruction of the environment, overconsumption of resources, you get this crazy housing booms and busts when I, I think 10 or 15 percent of the U.S. housing stock currently lies vacant. What an incredible predation <clears throat> upon the sure. earth and its resources that has been. And so uh, money, very briefly, of course, we all know government uh, has a near monopoly over education, uh, the edification of the young. And so when we look at bad decisions made by adult citizens, uh, as I think, Peter, you very well pointed out, uh, in almost all of your, your work, there is a fundamental inability to reason, to think. The critical thinking, Socratic questioning is almost completely absent from public discourse these days. Well, government has the, the, the children for 12 years, uh, or if you can't daycare or pre-daycare, it has from 13 or 14 years, maybe even 15 years. And so the government uh, is producing these citizens who can't think, who are susceptible to all kinds of manipulative advertising, who have a massive incentive to spend now rather than save because of inflation. 
and so on. And of course, there has uh, in the West, I would argue, been a breakdown over the past 50 or so years, uh, largely as a result of specific government policies, a breakdown uh, of the uh, of the family, uh, and particular absentee fathers. Right, the, the, there's two fundamental things that children need to develop empathy. Empathy, I would argue, is the most important resource that we have in the world today, or we need in the world today. And empathy is on continual decline. Sociopathy in the general population has doubled over the past 15 years. This is catastrophic. And uh, two things that children need to develop empathy. One is free play in nature which I think has been largely bypassed uh, through a variety of things. And the other is the presence of uh, a, a father. And um, these things have generally been stripped out of childhood. Childhood is now pretty chaotic. Uh, I think about 90% of American women stop breastfeeding before the first year, which of course means that children have uh, uh, less bonding, less security, less um, uh, health, right? They, because it's very, um, uh, very strong, very good for the immune system to be breastfed and so on. So there's all these problems, and then they get dumped in daycare, which causes a you know a, a lack of bonding or or, or um, a lack of capacity to empathize with others. Sure. So fundamentally, we have you know government controls money, government controls education, and government has largely disrupted uh, the family through a variety of mechanisms, which has resulted in a very strange, destructive, empty, sociopathic American psycho type system that is currently eating its own young and shitting in its own nest. And um, I certainly uh, strongly uh, urge people to look critically at the existing system. Uh, whatever solution you come up with, it's almost hard to make it worse than where we're heading. So that's sort of my brief introduction to um, where I think we are. Uh, Peter, please feel okay, free I, to. I absolutely agree with everything you stated. I guess what I would disagree with is where this root causality rests, where this power distortion, where this bubbling wave of of insecurity and necessity by the state to conduct all of these affairs where where the, the crony capitalism so to speak where the the interest to take control of the money uh, originates uh, in its core philosophical foundation the the fundamental prim principles that i want to put forward take all everything you just said which again i completely agree with but you're not describing a root source of why these mechanisms are actually materializing. And I think that there's something very strong to be said for the fact that at the root of our survival is a very Malthusian presence. And I'm kind of jumping ahead here based on the train of thought that I wanted to go through. Uh, but you've presented a, a whole slew of, of things. You're making my head spin because I, I see so many different forms of causality to link these issues together. But there's a deeply truncated frame of reference with respect to the way we think about what's possible on the planet. And we have continued to perpetuate the same fundamental fears and scarcity driven ethos which has inevitably led to the state inevitably led to the various distortions which take lives of their own by the way and i i know it's difficult to, to pull causality down to say one perception of competition and scarcity and then extrapolate that all the way out and try to see why the u.s government is dumbing down its children or perhaps not even trying to per se but the effect of that system is such why there's so much structural violence why there's so much crime and structural violence is actually going to be a big part of this as well so if you wouldn't mind i'd like to i'd like to come back to my original, um, you're free to interject throughout this, but come back to this sort of three fallacy points that that really get to a much core root, much farther root source, at least as far as my perception is concerned. Do you mind if I kind of slam through this? It no, no. Take, okay. Um, Go for it. I think that in this sort of anarcho-capitalist uh, philosophical disposition, there are a series of arguments uh, that are often used to idealize the free market, to idealize a free society. I'm sorry, too. I, I just told you to go ahead, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for those listeners who aren't aware, anarcho-capitalism is the argument that the non-aggression principle and property rights uh, should be the foundational principles of society since taxation is a form of theft and the government relies upon the initiation of force for its power. Uh, it is a stateless society that respects property rights and the non-aggression principle. I'm sorry to interrupt, but just you know, no, no, I don't want to launch into technicals for people no, who are I, unfamiliar. I, I, we could go crazy redefining terms when it comes to this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to more or less assume that most of the audience is familiar with what you're about and has a fundamental understanding of economic theory. So, at least in a historical sense. So the first issue that jumps to me is what I call the den denial of principle continuum. It's a continuum fallacy or a matter of degree fallacy. This is the argument that presents two seemingly separate conditions that in truth cannot be considered distinct as the same principle actually exists behind both of them. For example, the state, which of course I agree with your, your basic criticisms as far as effects, but the problem is that 
there's an erroneous uh, separation of behavior and the creation of the state from the underlying philosophical principles inherent and intense, I should say, inherent to the historical premise of the market system. The market necessity of competition, self-preservation, differential advantage, and self-interest does not and would never stop at the traditionally assumed edge of the market board game, if you will, where the referees stand. It's like they're having a football game and assuming everyone's going to stay within the lines. It's not like that when you consider what's at risk. The state and its creation and its its use for as a tool for differential advantage is simply another strategy or tool in the gaming strategy of competition. And I think that's an incredibly important point. So even if you set reset everything right now, and I have this conversation with another friend of mine recently that was trying to describe this circumstance, and they said, well, you know, if we just got all this stuff in place, it would start to amalgamate and it would change things. Even if you reset everything right now, including a lot of the central bank issues you just talked about, removing the so-called state elements of the state would gravitate back towards force and coercion as you define it regardless because the principal economic observation of resource scarcity and the game theory of competition remains and this worldview will always justify the need to maintain advantage over other producers and groups by whatever means necessary as history has proven now I could talk a lot about the history of the state, and I, this is something else I think I was going to address because I didn't want to. I want to approach these three principles in one shot. But I think the one thing I should bring up because it, I think it's important is the historical failure to recognize the purpose of the state as it's existed in absolute concert with the development of economy. Whether you're talking about slavery, whether you're talking about feudalism, whether you're talking about mercantilism, whether you're talking about the version of free market capitalism we have today, because I know you don't agree it's actually true, but I think it's exactly the state that it always ever will be and can be. This premise of economy is what supports political economy. It is underlying all political systems. Every single political system and its behavior always sources itself back to the root economic premise. So I'm going to go on to the second system, the second point of, uh, excuse me, second fallacy. And I call that the delusion of system contrary moral imposition. Sorry for the annoyingly intellectual statement. This is very simple. Imposed ethical assumptions, behaviors and values, moral codes like you would see in the Bible or in traditional ethos that you find with philosophers that talk about right and wrong, moral ethical assumptions that stand in contrast to the psychology inherent and generated by the operant reinforcers of a given social structure simply will not endure over time. In other words, it's a psychological law of human adaptation that we will behave and game in accord with what is actually serving our interest most effectively in any given social order, especially, especially when it comes to our survival and quality of life. It's fundamental operant conditioning. In other words, if you have a society that isn't structurally reinforcing the idealized behavior, it's not going to prevail as dominant. And this is stated because I, I hear you often speak of sort of ethical concepts, you know, within the structure. And anyone that's, of course, dealing with philosophy and is obviously thinking about what tr appropriate behavior really is, which, as an aside, I derive strictly from physical science. I, I threw out my, I, my, my uh, books on general philosophy a long time ago because they're dated, they are antiquated, they're they don't have an actual physical referent for the language and the concepts that are putting forward, but that's for another subject. But the underlying basis of market psychology is predicated on the assumption that resource scarcity and hence the need to compete for such means is prevalent. And this creates an immutable necessity, immutable necessity to draw power and discount the well-being of others. No matter you know, what the prevailing fashion of moral code is, it will always rise to the surface whatever is being reinforced by society. In other words, a free society based on true human equality, which I think you both, you and I both very much want, is actually impossible because the psychological reinforcers are not there at all. And the final fallacy... Which now, I'll go sorry, um, do you okay. want to... Because uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'm happy, sure. certainly, I don't want to interrupt your flow too much. I'm happy to I wait until till you finish can, the three points. I can, I can jump back in. This, this next one actually is going to go to uh, describe the, the flaws in your concept of coercion and voluntarism. And that's going to be a, mm -hmm. a tricky one. So let's go ahead and you go ahead and talk about whatever you need to with respect to what I've said prior. Um, 
Now, um, when you were a, 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 a stockbroker, what, did you have customers or were you trading on your own behalf? I wasn't a stockbroker. I was a private equity trader. I traded from home. So you, you traded on your own behalf? Yes. Okay. And the, I mean, I'm asking that not because I'm, I'm sort of trying to trick you in some way, but just because there's a, a lot of people who haven't actually run a customer facing business or a customer focused business. Uh, when you said that the, the competition relies that you discount the well being uh, of others, uh, if you run a business, and you, are, you have customers, of course. Your customers are there with you by choice, right? Assuming your business isn't, say, <laughs> um, Monsanto or, or Microsoft or other companies which rely on state privilege, Halliburton, uh, Blackwater, all these kinds of nasty entities. But if you are in a volunteer, I was in the software field, which is sort of the Wild West, so to speak, which means the most peaceful and progressive <laughs> of uh, the areas uh, left of the free market. If you have customers and they're there with you by choice, if you discount the well-being of your customers, you're out of business in about 90 seconds. You okay. really, really have to focus on providing voluntary value to, me, to your customers and maintaining that value over time. Uh, you wake up in the morning as an entrepreneur and all you do is think about how you can make your customers happier, how you can make their lives easier. Uh, now, of course, you're doing that for the cause of profit, but profit is how you measure whether you're being good okay. or effective let's, at, let's uh, uh, at reducing value so for your customers. I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's not deviate too much. I'll, I'll give you, since you brought up an anecdotal case of my former profession as a private equity trader, I'm going to go back a little bit farther to my former profession as a manager in a video production house that I worked in, when probably one of my first main long-term jobs when I got out of college. I worked for a company that slowly over time started going bankrupt. This company hired about 20 people. We downsized to about 10 people. They began to lie to all of us. All of our paychecks went back about five months. I went up and talked to them in pure honesty to try to figure out what was going on. They just, just described and you know they were basically lied to us in effect that they were just waiting on this, this, and this. I found out later that they were officially going bankrupt, which meant that I couldn't go to small claims court to get the money that I wanted. I had to pay my rent, which I was late on. I had to do a lot of things along with everybody else in the entire arena that hadn't been paid whatsoever, the employees. The people that owned it did not mean bad. They had a general market failure, the market correction that generally happens. Their product was inefficient. What did that create? That created the necessity for them to extend out as far as they could so they could feed their children to screw all of us by necessity. There was one guy there who was on a visa that they owed about $15,000. He was officially a slave because he couldn't even be in the United States without their support of the visa. I had to take all of, the st all of my work off of their servers and hold it ransom in order to get the money that they owed me away from their pockets and their children's mouths because I had to pay my rent and feed myself. That is the true face of the market economy, my friend. And you can idealize all of this stuff about voluntarism and how you just have to, there's a natural ebb and flow and if you just do this, this, and this, that no one will be, no one will be a suspect to exploitation or abuse or the inherent violent coercion that is structural. But the true face of the market, especially when you look around at the truth of reality, I look at the truth of reality, not the theory. When I look at the world today with, say, one person dying every three seconds unnecessarily. When I look at the fact that there are, in truth, based on UN distinctions of human trafficking and what slavery means, there are today more slaves in the world than ever before in human history. When I speak to the truth of the fact that every single life support system is in decline due to resource exploitation, equal exploitation that goes on the human side, applied to the abuse of the topsoil, abuse to everything that we're doing, destruction of water resources, this is a dramatic failure that we're seeing across the board, destroying public health and destroying ecological health. So, All right, but let me, I, just give you a, let me just give you a slight counter, though. So you're sure. talking about, and I'm sorry you had this experience, definitely these are not people with a high sense of moral integrity when it actually, comes to the marketplace. Actually, actually, actually but um, first of all, you're talking about how somebody was being subject to a visa, uh, and that, of course, is a government thing. Uh, the, you said you that through bankruptcy that you could not pain. use – sorry, let me, let me finish my point, then I'll be quiet. Sure. Uh, you said that through bankruptcy uh, proceedings you could not retrieve your money. Well, bankruptcy is something that is invented by the state. I don't actually agree with it too much. I think that bankruptcy is pretty terrible uh, the way it currently works. And the, second, or the third thing you said was that uh, you basically couldn't get your money back from these people who lied to you. 
uh, I would imagine that they were shielded behind a corporation, which is a government created and government controlled uh, imposition on the free market, which has, I mean, in the financial industry itself, before there were corporations, people who ran financial companies were personally liable. They could lose their houses. They could lose their, I guess, horse and buggies back in the day. Uh, and then they went to the government and they said, we'd really like a legal shield so that we can take money out of the company. But if the company does anything bad or illegal or loses money, nobody can get us for the money that we've lost for them. So the government's handed over this lovely little legal shield called a corporation. But again, visas, bankruptcy court, corporations, these are all government things you're talking about. I'm not sure no. what that has to do with, with the no. free market as I'm talking about it. Absolutely not. The, the the use of government as an arm of differential advantage, obviously, the first of all, the government is run by the higher end entrepreneurs of our world. The ownership class has been running the government since day one. It is an extension of the market system. Of course, of course, they're going to go to the government and coerce them or not coerce per se or get them on their side so they can actually have the benefit of having a corporation that has no legal responsibility. That is a natural outgrowth of the gaming strategy inherent. There are no rules in this. It is the it is the fallacy of concept, the fallacy and naivety that these types of actions and the development of power sources that override the precious ideal of the free market, it is this fallacy that runs so concurrent with this kind of delusion of market economics that it just makes me want to pull my hair out. And I'm going to, I'm going to continue that because the, the, truncated, the truncated distinctions, the final fallacy is exactly what needs to be brought up here. Truncated distinctions, which is, which is, again, what you've just spoken of. This means that on certain ideas which appear to have integrity are found to be, in truth, too narrow in their consideration to be deemed viable philosophically or empirically. In other words, the true underlying meaning and purpose claimed to be represented is substantially misrepresented, and hence the concept becomes empirically void. For instance... There are two words I hear constantly you speak of in your community and your general philosophical treatments. One is coercion, the other is voluntarism. Both of these terms, while accurate in your narrow use with respect to economic and behavioral theory, are in truth irrevocably short-sighted when compared to the spectrum of real-life patterns and possibilities regarding the most relevant underlying component principles of those terms. Let me give you an example, because I know that might have sounded enormously extensive intellectual. A lot of adjectives. I'm, I'm looking for some proof. <laughs> well, let's take the notion of coercion. Well, I'm giving an argument. What is the practice? Excuse me. Coercion. Let's define coercion. Uh, the, what is coercion? Define coercion for me, just so we can make it simple and interactive here. What's coercion? Yeah, I mean, the initiation of force or fraud uh, against somebody who's not initiate the initiation of force and fraud okay. is the easiest way to talk about it. So under the surface, it's about imposing, it's about controlling, it's about abuse, it's about violence, it's about induced suffering. So if we look at this kind of induction or infliction of suffering, I want to ask you a, a question then, because it's really about resolving suffering at its core. It all becomes moot when it comes to the system process. In the context of economics, I see your point, but let's get down to the core of this. If, I, if there was a disease that in one country was killing 200 people, and in another country, another disease was killing 200,000 people, which disease would you focus on? Obviously, you'd focus on the one killing 200,000 people, right? I'm not sure why that would necessarily follow. Well, because you would want to resolve that disease that is killing the most people, that has the people that have the least immunity or the least defense no, against I'm sorry. That Again, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure why that would necessarily follow. I mean, what if my daughter was one of the 200 people? What if I were one of the 200 people? Speaking, I might I'm, find an incentive to focus on sure. the 200 rather than the 200,000. You, you, can, you can marginally split that as much as you want, but when it comes to general public health, if you ask any public health official and statistician which would be the greatest threat, which would rapidly produce and maybe take over the whole world if it's that, if it's that viral, obviously they're going to resolve the disease that's killing the most people. Now... With that in mind, are you familiar with the concept of structural violence? No. Okay, well, it was featured in Zeitgeist moving forward quite extensively and is the crutch of a very important uh, philosophical view, a moral and ethical view when it comes to what's happening in the world today. While we all understand behavioral violence and policy violence, which is often you know, what you refer to by government or state coercion, structural violence is mostly hidden. And it deals with chain reactions sourced to certain broad institutional influences. 
And if you read this book, it's, I mean, if you read these, these studies, which they're extensive, I recommend uh, Harvard criminal psychologist center for, uh, excuse me, criminal psychologist uh, James Gilligan, who headed the center at, Har at Harvard for violence uh, many years back, an absolute, uh, an absolute expert on violence and its sources and its root form. Uh, he talks about this extensively with tremendous sources. I would drop that just so people can research this. So, what happens here is that there's a defining characteristic that, that occurs that you deem all the way down to what's called structural or social inequality. Social inequality is one of the most insidious attributes in the world today with respect to public health. It manifests in absolute form, which is, say, poverty, and it manifests in relative form, which is basically the development of psychosocial stress. If you're familiar with the work of Gabor Mate, he talks about this type of idea at length as well. So long story short, structural violence is in fact, is in fact in unequivocally the leading cause of death on the planet Earth. In a 1976 study, I believe it was called the Empirical empirical table of structural violence. I can't remember the authors, but anyone can punch this up. It was found that 18 million deaths occur each year because of essentially inequality and structural policy based around or that generates inequality. And guess what the root of this inequality is? The state cannot be held as some root catalyst of inequality or or the other fallacious external terms such as crony capitalism, which which again harp upon the first fallacy I put forward because the same fundamental principles exist. You can't differentiate capitalism from crony capitalism. It comes from the very root source of our socioeconomic principles, the market itself. It is an explicit and direct consequence of the gaming of competition and advantage. It's, in a, math it's a mathematical inevitability and you can see this by simply comparing different countries based on their rates of homicide, rates of violence, uh, rates of death based on poverty associated to the level of inequality that's in their country. And if you extrapolate from 1976, there have been about, oh, 600 million people that have died due to poverty and inequality in all of its forms, absolute and relative. And that isn't even accounting for the gross increase in inequality we've seen globally as well. So with all due respect... Sorry, but what is, the, what, is the definition, what is the definition of structural violence? Structural violence is a type of violence that is imposed, well, it depends on who you ask because it's become more of a general term, but in its traditional state, it took only into consideration the effects of social inequality. But today you'll find other researchers describing the structural violence of, you know, any type of institution that has a causal link. For example, a type of structural violence linked to well, I think poverty is the easiest one because it, it sprawls out in so many different ways. Uh, a mother, for example. I, I know, for example, you talk about children a lot. You, you, you talk about how the root of our values and the such come from parenting, how important that is. And I absolutely agree. But what isn't being counted is the fact that all parents are subject to an enormous amount of pressure. If a parent... Or a, if, you know, first of all, a divorce is the leading cause of divorce is financial. I think we all know that, and, that, and divorce has had a tremendous psychological effect on children. There's a whole spectrum of these things. But I often use the example of a woman. She's a single mother. Uh, she gets fired from her job. It wasn't her fault. She was fired. They just had to downsize for whatever purpose. Basic market correction. She's unable to take care of her child. That child uh, can't. She can't afford health care. She can't afford to have a babysitter. She deals with whatever she can, and she's loosely been able to take care of this child because of the pressures around her. She doesn't have the means to do so. And one day, the child stumbles and uh, has some type of accident that would not have happened if there was actually the condition for that parent or parents to properly have the capacity to take care of their children. And this spirals out into the sphere of uh, public health. And it's incredibly important. If you're not familiar with it, I'm absolutely amazed because it is the most important attribute and why I am so, in, so disgusted by the market system because it reinforces inequality more than anything else. Every single historical text that goes back both in criticisms of advocation of capitalism have denoted this inequality, much harped upon by people like Thomas Malthus who firmly ingrained the need or the propensity or the assumption that there isn't enough to go around and therefore for inequality is inevitable, and I can go on a long tangent about all the other distortions that arise. I just have from to that. interrupt for a sec because I just looked something up. You said that the leading cause of divorce was economic uh, problems, um, at least according to the top five reasons for 2000 level matrimonial survey by Grant Thompson in the UK. 
Uh, the number one reason is falling out of love. That's 27 percent. Extramarital affair is number two at 25 percent. Uh, unreasonable behavior at 17 percent. Uh, midlife crisis at 10 percent and emotional or physical abuse at 6 percent. Uh, the last stuff I read um, in North America was that the uh, leading, I mean, the majority of divorces were initiated by women and the number one cause was uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, okay. And well, so I appreciate, I, just I appreciate if you can your, give me the source for the economic stuff, that would be great. Oh, I have, I have at least three texts that source that. Uh, first of all, you, statistical things run into problems all the time. Almost every single person I've seen get divorced has had tremendous financial issues. I have read that statistic at least five times. I will email you that statistic. And if that isn't actually correct anymore, I can assure you it is a very large part of what's happening in the world as far as familial problems. Almost every argument I have with my girlfriend these days revolves around money. So you can take your little isolated dismissal of that and run with it. That's fine. I don't care. It's, it's completely irrelevant to the wait, point wait, wait, at wait, hand. Wait. That's the structural Hang on. That, issue. That sounded, that sounded a little bit insulting. Take well, my little isolated dismissal. Uh, well, you provided information that I had counter information to. Is that not allowed in this conversation? No, but I think it completely bypasses the point I'm trying to make. It utterly bypasses and creates a distraction. I'm sorry. If facts contradict the point that you're trying to make, do you not want me to bring them up? No, facts don't contradict anything. You can nitpick about certain issues all you want, but you're distracting from the actual structural violence issues I'm trying to talk about. So someone listening to this conversation, the sake of argument, you run to do a little internet search and try to find something to debunk something I've just said, which is corollary to what I'm actually pointing out. Listen, I'm highly fallible. If I run any type of stat and it's found to be wrong, first of all, I'll show you my source. Happy to send it to you. But I would like to focus on what's actually critically relevant here, and that's the source of structural violence. Let me get back to my point. With all due respect... Yep. When I think about this reality of structural violence and the 18 million people and more that die every single year unnecessarily due to inequality and poverty from absolute and relative deprivation, and I listen to heady Austrian economists talking about the inherent violence and coercion of the income tax system and other relatively stupid shit in the wake of unnecessarily unnecessary, I should say, daily mass murder originating from the market system's competitive propensity for gross and constant wealth imbalance. And all the problems that come from that, I'm not wait, impressed. Wait, sorry, are you saying that the market, wait, wait, are you saying that the market system, for, first of all, income tax causes a huge amount of stress on marriages. Income tax has been argued to be the primary reason why you need a two-income household and kids are getting dumped in daycare. So if you're going to say that marriage has problems because of financial pressures, and then you're right. going to dismiss the income tax, which is the largest single bill that most couples have, I think you might be missing the point. And second, right. you're talking about how the free market, what, engages in mass murder? Can you step me through that? How, how the free market Without the, the uh, money and power of the state and the weapons of the state, how it engages in mass murder, I'd like to understand it, that. It creates perpetual and constant inequality by its structural design, period. So you the free market creates inequality, is that right? That's correct. So when cell phones were first introduced and they cost about $10,000 each, and now you can get a cell phone, like a, a burner cell phone for like 20 or 30 bucks, that is somehow creating inequality in the distribution of cell phones in society? That's, an, that's a completely arbitrary example because you're taking one instance of a particular service. Is it service. Not a real world example? Oh, it's a real world example, but it's completely contrary. It's, it's completely absent of the point I'm trying to make in the broad statistical view. No, it's I'm not sorry. absent, hey, Peter. You're talking about how the free market creates inequality, but the free market is constantly trying to get cheaper and better goods into the hands of people. That's how I'm you make money. About, you can I'm see this happening with computers. You can see this happening with cell phones. In any place where the market is really allowed to operate, prices go down and feature sets go up. For instance, when microwaves were first introduced, they cost what a car costs now. Now you can pick up a microwave for 40 Nine bucks at Walmart. I'm so well, just well, about every household has a microwave. Just about every household has a color TV. Just about every household has an internet service. So the fact is that it doesn't seem, I mean, I agree with you, inequality is growing in American society at the moment. But I would argue that's because of the growth of the states, nothing, because the free market is diminished in its capacity to drive down the prices of goods and drive more of the acceptance of goods into poorer households. I'm speaking of pure statistics. I'm speaking of research that's been done. I'm speaking of the broad view. I'm not speaking of the fact that, yes, there are more material possessions in the hands. And, you, yes, the, the poor. You, when I yes, give you like poor, five examples in a row, you can't just dismiss them all and say you're speaking of some broad view, right? I mean, that, that's just no, substituting an abstraction for an example. 
No, because you're, you're deviating from the, the broad concept, the broad statistical point I'm trying to make. I agree with all of those points. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying the fact that, for example, there are the poor of the United States are much better off than the poor, excuse me, than the wealthy many hundreds of years ago in material terms. And that's another subject that I could go on a tangent on, but to stay within the point I'm trying to make here, the inherent inequality that has been with the market economy been really with the entire ethic of the institution of formalized structural, excuse me, the institution that is built upon scarcity and the need for human exploitation, which is what this system really roots itself down and is the necessity for people to get advantage so they can survive at the expense of others sometimes. Sometimes it works out, but there's a general imbalance and this is the underlying ethic. This element has created constant imbalance throughout the entire course of capitalism and before. It's a fundamental ethic. And yes, 600 million people have died unnecessarily in the wake, in the wake of a fucking technical reality where we can feed, clothe, and house, and provide health care, and do and resolve pretty much all of the fundamental needs and abundance of energy to every single human on earth. I'm talking about reality to the extent when I look around, I see this game that we're playing that is all of these hideous byproducts, and yet we and yet we're not doing the things that could actually bring the technical things to fruition. And why can't we do those technical things? Okay, so because let's, let's go back to the math the, the antithesis. Example because you were, look, are, look you and I don't point. have to disagree. There's no point debating on whether it's bad that millions of people are dying. You and I, I think, millions. are both very committed to that. So I fully accept that. But you did talk about how the free market produces mass murder. We'll get into exploitation because that's a term I always have some trouble with. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means I don't understand how you're using it. But if we can go back to the mass murder example, how is it that the free market produces mass murder in the absence of state power. The market system's inherent fundamental premise is based on scarcity. It's based on the assumption of having to gain at the possible No, 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 no. The free market no, no, that's just incorrect. The free market system is based on a respect for property rights and the non initiation of force. Scarcity is a fact of nature. Uh, scarcity is a fact of nature, but it's not as much of a fact of nature as it has been. And the great shift, which I'll talk about as we talk about a new economic model here, the great powerful shift is that the scarcity focus is no longer necess necessary as the focus of social of social economic unfolding. It's the so, actually. So what you're saying actually, is scarcity is not foundational to the free market. Scarcity is a fact of reality. I'm saying scarcity is certainly a fact of reality, but not in even remote proportion the way it used to be. The problem what's happened now is the market premise is predicated on the assumption of scarcity and everything is built upon that. Everything is navigated around this assumption that there isn't enough to go around. Hence the concept of economizing, which we all know. The new trends today, the, what, the great transition that's occurring in human thought today and our industrial capacity to create an abundance and post-scarcity is that we need to orient our system towards the interest to create an abundance, not towards the interest of preserving scarcity, which is preserving the integrity of scarcity to make sure people don't go you know, insane and start to battle each other through war. So the, the, it has its role, and it always kind of will in a certain principle, but we're never going to achieve a post-scarcity rule. We're never going to see balance. We're never going to see social equality in the truest terms. You know, I think back to Martin Luther King, and his final interest was equal, was equal pay for all of all society, because he knew that racism and the bias of bigotry really didn't stop at the at the perception of color of skin. It was built into the economic model. Gandhi saw this as well. In fact, Gandhi was the highest observer of structural violence in his intuition who said poverty is the worst form of violence. Coming back to my original point, this system perpetuates inequality and larger and larger extensive inequality. You cannot argue that the state alone is the only interference attribute that enables the type of extensive inequality that we see. Because all you have to do is compare different countries to see the difference between those that have very rigid controls, hence state control, not necessarily in the highly coercive way that we see in the U.S. tax system and the like, but still they are limiting the market very directly and regulating it very specifically from the top down, and they have much less violence, they have much less homicide rates, they have much less inequality and all the mental and psychological neuroses that are born of that. So in this thing called the non-aggression principle, and what frustrates me again is that everything you speak of I agree with within the principles that you advocate. See, I don't agree with the 
that the idea of the market, that as you as you conceive of it, is is just that a system of voluntary exchange with non-coercion, and people just follow this basic ethical guideline that everything's going to be fine. I look at it from its root source and course of human evolution, and, and using history as a guide. I look at the root psychology of what it means to have this concept that's preve pre prevailing in society, where you're supposed to be put on a pedestal for gaining while others suffer. This psychology and value system disorder is ever pervasive, and it really does define the state. And I can't. Well, okay, but uh, sorry, I'm I'm waiting for you to take a breath, but I feel I'm going to wait in vain. So uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a sec. So this idea that in a free market you gain while other people suffer uh, is is foundationally incorrect. I mean, as as the Austrians would say, it's praxeologically incorrect. Uh, right. So, and I know you know this, but just for the for the listeners, of course. Um, fundamentally, if you and I exchange something and there's no coercion involved, I don't have a gun to your ribs, I don't have your children hostage or anything like that. If you and I exchange something voluntarily, by definition, we are both better off because of that exchange, right? So the old example is if I have a dollar and you have a pencil and we voluntarily exchange those two items, then by definition, in praxeologically, in reality, foundationally, rationally, empirically, I must want the pencil more than I want my dollar, and you must want my dollar more than you want your pencil, because we're freely exchanging those things. So in a free market exchange, two, the two parties who voluntarily exchange are by definition better off. Uh, they have, and, and this is true if I decide to go and work for someone rather than start my own company, uh, I choose that as a better course for myself. Um, uh, if I choose to go and start my own company, I've both worked for people and started my own company. It's just a matter of personal choice. As long as there's no force involved, as long as there's no fraud involved, unlike your unfortunate experience with the video production company, by definition, both parties are better off because they have both chosen uh, voluntarily to perform that particular exchange. Uh -huh. And so there's no way to get around that. That's just a basic fact. Okay. Now, if and, you and use I'm the government to, to, to print money and give it to you before the inflation hits the poor, which is wretched in the foundation, unfortunately, of our economy, if you use the military industrial complex, you know, most of the jobs that have been created since the financial crash of 2007 have been in the military industrial complex. It's completely evil. Uh, and this is the mass murder. But I mean, what on earth is the mass murder? As I sort of go back to this point, what okay. does this have to do I with understand. the free market? I understand. Once again, you you blockade, and this is the concept of truncated frames of reference that I was in the midst of, I'm still in the midst of describing, and we can talk about voluntarism in a second. In uh, in pure vacuum and in the void of space, uh, these theories hold true. In other words, you can have perfect circles when there's nothing else drawing influence. The fact of the matter is we live in a, a constant continuum of pressures. Uh, let's, let's jump into voluntarism, if you don't mind. And I don't use the same simplistic view as you do, and then this will explain why. So I would really appreciate it if you would stop calling my view truncated and simplistic. If you no, prove I mean that my view is truncated and simplistic, you don't need the damn adjectives. If you well, don't I'm, prove it, then it's just bullshit uh, ad hominem, right? So already, just refrain from the, if I can ask for that intellectual respect, refrain from constantly insulting my position. I don't believe I've constantly insulted yours. Okay, no, I'm not trying to insult yours, and I'm sorry you interpreted that. When I say truncated, oh, I'm so not, simplistic and truncated are, are terms of respect. I, I see. No, simplistic and truncated are qualifiable distinctions that I'm using in the association. Prove it. Don't I'm say it. Well, Just I prove am. it. Pro I prove am. it. Don't say it. That's all I'm saying. Well, you can keep stopping me from speaking by acknowledging that, or I can keep going. Is that, can, I, can I talk? No, no, I'm just, I'm just asking you to lay off the ad hominem sets. I'm all. sorry. Listen, I want to, I want to stop right here. I'm not trying to be offensive, and I'm, I, I want you to understand that I like you share a frustration with the way the world is. Okay? If you see any element of agitation come from me, it has nothing to do with you. I really do respect what you're trying to do, and I agree with a great majority of what you put forward. I think your your perspective and values, and when it comes to human development and the things that I've I haven't been able to research everything that you talk about, but I've really really enjoyed listening to the things that you speak of and your capacity and your your talent and as in oration and communication. I am coming from a very serious position when I look at the flaws of this planet, and I cannot when I use the term truncated and simplistic, I mean those in the most quantifiable, if that was even possible, terms. And I'm going to give you examples, and I'm going to explain as we move along. Voluntarism. Action, def action based on non-coercion is probably the best definition, right? Voluntarism? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are two basic broad presuppositions, if you will, inherent to this common concept, and especially in economic use. The first is a little bit difficult to describe because it's, it's, 
it's hard for people to relate to it at all, but I'm going to give it, give it a shot. The first is this distorted implication of free will. As though any action we manifest exists in a vacuum, absent the ever-pervasive conscious and subconscious social and psychological pressures we endure on a daily basis. Humans have a limited capacity to control their own behavior. It's a fact. We exist in a continuum of social influences that are invariably subject to the behavioral propensities and reactions of the culture we inhabit. That said, as a broad overarching consideration, the second more specific issue is that there is a clear and present fallacy that engagement at all in the market system is voluntary, as though we are all just equal in our reductionist existence as voluntary exchangers. This just might be the most absurd concept of all when it comes to this type of worldview. The market system's structural imposition for survival itself, in my view, unnecessarily given the state of technology and our capacity to create an abundance, coerces all human beings to submit to labor for income and to engage in the act of trade whether they like it or not. It's not voluntary, and believe me, if it was voluntary, I would be fucking gone. I'd be on the hippie planet where people actually share ideas and resources and not act like spoiled children fighting over everything. So in the core root principle of voluntarism, it's thrown right out the window because the system is intrinsically coercive, okay? And that's a powerful point because when you begin to look at the stress of our society, when I but we, but sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just I, I, I'm not following what you're saying. Okay, how is voluntary trade coercive? That just seems to me like saying love making is rape. It just seems like you're just jamming two opposite things together and calling because, them the same. Because the act of trade itself is coercive. I'm not saying that. And how the, is the I, act of trade coercive? Because people have to trade in this system to survive unnecessarily. They have to do they don't something. Have to trade. They have to. Well, do, how do they, they have to trade? They have to either trade. They can go. Their they can labor. go and and I mean, ninety-eight percent of the world's surface is uninhabited. They can go and live in the woods, oh. and they can grow their own food, and oh, they can true. hunt their own animals. That's I don't true. understand how it is they have to trade. Uh, that that's a wonderful point. I think that's hilarious. I think it's great to look at a global <laughs> economic system and decide that it's voluntary for people not to have to engage in the market system. That's hilarious. I, if I could do that, sorry, I but would saying that's hilarious is not actually a rebuttal. Oh, I mean, no, people don't have to right. trade. I think that you the point that I'm making right. is it's to their advantage to trade. Oh. I think people find that the division of labor, like I fish and you grow wheat and we we trade or whatever, the division of labor and all of that is economically productive. That people specialize in doing things and then trade the results of that labor, so we don't all have to become good at everything. I think people find it advantageous to trade, but saying how that somehow forces them to trade, uh, I think, is not clear to me. I, I've, I've watched the vast majority of my friends who got out of college exist in occupations and in, in just institutions to get money that were nothing in respect to what their talents were. It had nothing to do with them. They despised it. I've watched people commit suicide. I watched them. I had a friend who commit suicide because he couldn't get a job after so many periods, such a period of time. He had no sustenance. His entire sense of self-worth was so demeaned. These types of things don't have to but, exist. But we, See, we I, both agree that what we're talking about now is not the free market. So when I talk uh, no. about the free market and you start saying, well, I know people in this environment, we I don't do understand not, what that has to do with what we're talking about. We do not both agree that this is not the free market. I am stating that the fundamental principles that underlie the free market, the absolute core of every single school of thought of, of market capitalism, if you will, is intrinsically inherent, is in, has an intrinsic inherent quality that gravitates to all the propensities that I'm speaking of. This is the free market. Whatever happens No, is no, real. sorry. And again, I have to be pretty technical here, if not just downright rational. Okay. Uh, the free market is voluntary exchange uh, and the state is the initiation of force. These That's two are definition. opposites. Exactly. That's it's like saying that, that lovemaking is rape or theft is charity. You're just no. mingling these two concepts together. Okay. The free market specifically repudiates the actions of the state, which is the initiation of force against usually legally disarmed citizens. So if you say, well, our current system is the free market, despite the fact that it's dominated by the state, which doesn't conform to any of the principles of the free market, uh, I think is missing the point. No, I, that's, your, that's your definition and your assessment of principles. I'm actually looking at the real world. I'm looking at the fact that, as I said earlier in the initial principles of fallacy, that the state is in fact an outgrowth, an arm of the power and differential advantage in gaming theory needs of, 
of the market itself. It is there just as anything else. There are people behind the scenes in government that make an enormous amount of money in the context of market economics, in the context of trade, in the context of everything that you speak of, but they use the arm of the state to their advantage for their elitist purposes. Do I think that's right? Absolutely not. I would love, Stefan, to see the type of market that you talk about. The problem is it's impossible. There will always be a gravitation towards these power consolidations. Some of them may work for a little while, some of them may falter, but there will always be that propensity. And when I say the oh, free but, market... But Peter, come on. Just saying that something is, poss is impossible doesn't make it so. You sound like somebody in the 16th century who's saying, well, we've always had slavery. Slavery has always been part of human society. Slavery has always been a part of trade, and therefore we're always going to have slavery. Now, I, I agree with you. It's terrible <laughs> that the slave trade is still uh, occurring, but generally in the West, uh, we've kind of got away with direct slavery. Now we have kind of indirect slavery through taxation, but that direct owning and buying and selling of human beings has been largely bypassed. So saying something is impossible and will never be and so on, I mean, for a guy okay. who's kind of a futurist, it seems to sure. me that's, that's kind of a leap. Well, I would say that it's just as impossible as the fact that the law of gravity, uh, I can't decide to just step on this wall over here. There are fundamental psychological principles that are inherent to the market psychology. It goes back to my initial fallacy that I call the delusion of system contrary moral imposition. And this idea of voluntarism and everything that goes underneath it, the non-aggression principle, all of it becomes moot in the wake of what this system is actually generating. And that's, that's it. I mean, you can call it the free market or not. I do not believe... Oh, so I if you say that something becomes moot, You've made a point. Well, I say that your system has become moot. Victory! I mean, you, you're not making any, you're just saying stuff. You're not actually making a case. I'm I put a very, very clear principled case that there's a difference, in fact, an opposite moral quality to uh, the initiation of force, which is the state, and to voluntary free trade, which is exchange for mutual benefit. You have and literally ignored everything. Saying that everything that's moot that and that's said. impossible, you're, you're not actually making a case for anything. You're just using a lot of adjectives. You're no, not proving I've, anything. I've, I have stated and I've given an enormous amount of evidence and argument towards a number of broad economic issues. You have ignored every single one of them and you're persisting with this tiny little box of economic idealism, of voluntary trade, as though these two machines in their marginal utility... Oh, so now you use the phrase tiny little box. I guess that's proven something too. You see, you're I, just using adjectives. You're not actually making a case. Listen, Tell I'm me here, how the state conforms about... with non-initiation of force because you're, you're lumping it in with the non-initiation of force, which is free trade. You're saying that the state is a natural outgrowth or part of the free market. And I'm saying the initiation of force is the opposite from voluntary trade. So you can tell me I'm incorrect if I've made a mistake of that. I'm certainly happy to hear it. But you can't just brush it off by saying it's a tiny little box. Tiny little box is not an argument. I'm, a tiny little box is an analogy. It's a way to get a communicative point across. Still not to, an argument. Well, no, it's not an argument. But I've, I'm facilitating many arguments simultaneously as much as you choose to dismiss them clearly. Uh, the state is an outgrowth of the market system because of its fundamental predicated premise. I don't know how many times I have to say that. If you can't see that, I don't know what to what say. What is the fundamental predicated premise? That's not an argument either. That's just a word salad. I have, re I have stated that about three or four times thus far with respect, respect to the fact that within the state is the mechanism of the market. The market creates the state because of its interest in self-preservation, differential advantage, and the basic gaming strategy. I'm sure you're familiar with all of the macroeconomic utilitarian assumptions by, by Nash and the like. The entire premise of gaming within this system is based around these levels of advantage. And to think... So, sorry, let me think, just understand here. I, I, look, I certainly agree with you that... that people in what's left of the market attempt to use the state to gain advantage over others. And that advantage is fundamentally coercive, destructive, and I would say evil in nature. So I completely agree with you there. But when you say the market creates the state, what you would then, I think, seem to be arguing was that at some point in the past, there existed uh, a, a free market, which then created a state where no state existed before. And it would seem to me, based on my understanding of history, that governments have been the dominating uh, factor throughout history. And they can be sort of local tribal governments like the warlords and the Genghis Khans and so on, of the more sort of formal modern uh, state. But it would seem to me that the market doesn't create the state, uh, but the market, um, uh, that there is a state which it, to some degree or another facilitates the size of the market, whether it enforces contract or whether it's heavily taxed or heavily regulated or not. But because there is the state, there is a competition. Like I sort of view the state like uh, there's a gun in the room and there's a bunch of gangsters. And this is an analogy, not a proof, so I'll be clear of that. Sure. But there is uh, a gun in the room 
and a, a whole bunch of gangsters are trying to get a hold of that gun so they can shoot each other. And the state is that gun in the room. And so when there is a government in society, uh, then, then marketers, capitalists, uh, entrepreneurs, whatever you want to call them, business owners, will always attempt to use the state to gain power over their opponents. Uh, uh, you can't get a monopoly in the free market that's ever been sustainable without using the state. And okay. so there are statistics that show that there's almost no single better investment that a company can make than a congressman or you know, a congresswoman. That, that investing in lobbying the state provides you returns in the hundreds of percent, something that is really hard. In the free market in general, you're good. You're likely to make three to six to seven percent profit. But if you invest in politics and you get a congressman on your side, you get 200, 250 percent return on investment from how much you have to spend in lobbying to how much you get in government benefits. So the existence of the state draws, you know, simply by the logic of what's left of the free market, it draws people to uh, use the state because any CEO who is going to eschew political action is going to re be replaced by the shareholders with a, a CEO who's going to embrace political action. So I agree with you that there is definitely a huge incentive to, uh, to pursue political action and gain economic advantage through the violence of the state over your competitors. But that's because there's a state. Uh, in a free market, it would not be possible to do that. In a, like an, an anarchic, no state free, free market. What I, find, what I find interesting about that argument is that you're basically admitting that that propensity is there. You're basically saying that it's if a natural. If there's a state, yes. You're, it's a natural propensity for this type of interest and power. So if there isn't a state, it wouldn't happen. That's, that's interesting. I don't know if I agree with that because if the interest is there to create some type of power consolidation to maintain differential advantage, to override the interests of other producers, to secure wealth and market share for a particular group, that could manifest in all sorts of other ways. I mean, I look at the state as just one example of how this power consolidation tendency materializes. And the true issue well, is look, not... Just to, give you a, just to give you a tiny example, right? And okay, I, I'll sure. keep it very brief. And I, I'm fully aware this is not exhaustive. And, and you know, I'm not going to claim to cinch anything in a theoretical argument to this level. But just a brief example is, let's say there's no government. I'm a sweater manufacturer. And I want to block all of these sweater imports from China so that I can raise my price 20% because the Chinese are really competitive and producing stuff cheaply or whatever. Well, if I'm a, a sweater manufacturer, to block all imports of uh, sweaters from other countries, if I want to put a duty of 40% on all, in, well, how am I going to collect it? How am I going to pay for people to do it? Am I going to intercept ships? I got to build a navy. I'm going to build a court system. And I, like, if I start to try and build the infrastructure to block free trade, if I'm in a free society, what I'm, what's going to happen is I'm going to have to spend so much that I'm going to be uncompetitive and, and everyone else is going to be able to undercut me because I have to recreate the entire apparatus of the state and have people accept it as legitimate, which means I'm going to be uncompetitive with other people who are not interested in recreating the state but rather making nice sweaters. But if there is already a state that has this power and this authority and this influence and this violent capacity already in every port and everybody respects it or at least believes it's legitimate, then I just have to go to a congressman, give them a bunch of money, and then in return I get a 40% duty on all sweaters coming in from overseas and therefore I can raise my prices. But in a free society, it's so expensive to recreate the state. The moment somebody tries to do that, they'll render themselves completely uncompetitive with everyone who's not trying to do that. I don't, I don't see how... You can assume that the, with the underlying ethic inherent in the market system that these types of power abuses by whatever means wouldn't materialize because as you admitted, they're actually inherent in the ethic of the system. I'm not trying to be no, so no, specific. No, no, I didn't say they're inherent in the ethic of the system. That's really important to clear, to be clear, clear about. What do you imply? I said it's, in, it's inevitable whether, whether there is a government. Uh, I think it's inevitable whether there's a distinction of the no, so-called No, no, I know what government. you think. I'm just saying don't misquote me about what okay. I said. I didn't well, say I, it's inherent in market capitalism. I said it's inherent whether there is a government. Well, I kind of would have to say that within the argument, within the recognition that this propensity is there, assuming that there's an inevitable fallibility to every entrepreneur, that if they see a state, they're going to run and use it to their advantage, the very core value disorder inherent in their interest to do that, to basically want coercion, which basically implies that every single entrepreneur in some fundamental theory is interested in gaining whatever type of advantage it can, it's, it creates a, a non-argument. You're the the very problem that I want to get rid of with the economy is this this very wait sorry did you just refer to what I said as a non argument is that your argument I just described how it was a non argument to the extent that if you have the I don't think you did system, actually I, I don't think you did say well, it was a non argument 
Well, if you keep interrupting me, then I won't be able to. I'm repeating what I'm. I thought said. you were moving on to another topic. Sorry. No, go I'm ahead. repeating what I'm said since you missed it the first time. If you have the incentive structure built into the entrepreneurship, the intention of maintaining def differential advantage, not worrying about the interest of others, because that's an inherent element of all elements of market psychology, and you're going to say that that element is fine as it exists, as long as there isn't a state. I completely disagree because they're going to the, the tendency of that is going to persist regardless. The tendency to want to create power monopoly consolidation will exist regardless, and it will happen. <laughs> and you can't say that there's the the free market will just stop it because its mechanisms are so strong and and all these supposed fail safes. The only fail safes that can stop it are the legal system. The legal system is the state. This. It's, it's okay, well, uh, first of all, I think we're back to the beginning where you said that they're not worrying about the interests of others. Uh, if you're a business owner, I guess you've never been a business owner, but if you're a business owner, you I actually a have a lot of people's interests that you need to worry about. You need to worry yeah. about your shareholders, your board, your employees, your customers, a lot of people's interests that you need to worry about. Uh, purely selfish people uh, you know, in a free market generally don't tend to do very well because it's win-lose. And the only way that businesses become sustainable in the long run in a free market is if it's win-win for the customers and for you. So this idea that you, if you're in business, you don't worry about the interests of others is just false. And I think it just arises from an inexperience in, in the business world. Uh, well, so that's sort of the first a, thing that I would say. I ran a I'm production sorry, company. I've run a production company for 10 years with numerous freelancers. And do you not worry about the interests of others? Do you not care about whether people watch your videos? Do you not care whether they're educated? Do you not care whether employees have a reasonably good time working with you? Do you not care about anybody else's interests other than your own? Within the spectrum of what I am capable of caring about, yes. For example, I might have a I might have a uh, freelancer that needs X amount per hour to get what they need done. I might be well aware that they are $100,000 in debt because of a bill or a college debt. I might be aware of all the needs that they, that they require in order to try to get themselves out of the, the state of impending coercion, as I would call it, that exists where they are just vulnerable to any type of social manipulation because they can't make ends meet. They would have to go. They could be at 7-Eleven. They do all these things that they don't want to do because of what this system does. I can be very aware of that. But if I don't personally have the means to provide for those needs, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's a matter of business acumen. Really good business acumen is not a moral decision. It is a decision of what can actually work. And the, the sickness of the whole profit price mechanism concept, the sickness of this idea that we just navigate everything within the slow confine, within the narrow confines of price and profit on the assumption that, oh, if you're going to be profitable, then you must be efficient. Of course, you have no idea what's creating that efficiency. It's a complete decoupling of nature. It's a complete decoupling from our understanding or our facilitation of public health. None of it's built in. And that jumped ahead, actually, to a point I wanted to make a little bit later. But to answer your question, I am well aware and I wish I could do a lot more when I, when I deal with people that are so you, But you, you do worry about the you, you do worry about the interests of others. You may not be able to alleviate all their problems, oh, so but you, I, do, hey, you do care about the interests yes. of others as a business owner, right? And that brings that brings a great point. Everyone means well. I'm not saying that people in this system just corrupt themselves. Everyone means themselves. well. What about sociopaths? I don't think sociopaths mean well and they're like four percent of the population. They probably think they mean well. That's a that's 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 an amusing point. But well, the point okay, is, then it's, across, an, it's a non-falsifiable proposition. So let's move on. Sure, it's when it comes down to the fact that people engage the system and they believe in it. They navigate in a, with a very narrow blinder on, in a very simplistic way, with respect to how they maintain their own survival. This is this is the underlying marketization, the market ethic that runs through. And as a natural structural consequence, you invariably have to forego the interests of others for self-interest. I think that. There's nothing that you could disagree with on that one. That's just the way it is. It doesn't mean their intentions I, are I wrong. I don't believe so. I, 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 Self-interest as a business owner is, in, in, is completely wrapped up in the satisfaction of customers, of stockholders, of, of uh, employees. Uh, if you have employees that you like working with who hate you, they'll quit and you will be then exposed to the cost of, of hiring and retraining other people. So, if you annoy, irritate, or, or, so you or believe, anger your customers, they will stop doing business with you and you will be out of a job. So, uh, if you uh, don't provide decent return for your shareholders while keeping all of those other things in consideration, then you are going to be uh, out of a job. If you anger the board, they can get you kicked off as a CEO. So uh, yet you absolutely tangibly have to worry about the, the interests and, and happiness of other people. Uh, in free trade, uh, if you can't get someone to want to do business with you, then you're kind of in trouble. Yes, absolutely. 
I'm not saying that that is a false statement, but going back to my my example with respect to the experience I had, the owners of this company did not mean bad. This was a generate a, a system pressure generation that happens naturally throughout the system because it's again predicated on scarcity. That's not not enough to go around. Everyone is struggling for this profit efficiency, and it, there will be winners and losers. There will be market correction. There will be market discipline, and. My point is that discipline and all of its structural violence and all of its permutations is inherently inhumane and unnecessary. Now, okay, so let me. Let, so you're saying that that market discipline. And market discipline is if you can't assemble your scarce resources, including your life and maybe your savings or whatever. If you can't assemble your scarce resources in a way that sufficiently satisfies the needs of others uh, and turns a profit, that that's somehow discipline. So if my daughter sets up a lemonade stand and she can't get people to buy her lemonade, that she's being subjected to some sort of violence? I'm saying that given in a world that we can create an abundance where there's a technical reality to solve numerous problems on one side, a technical state of efficiency that is so abundant and so obvious, we are restricting ourselves in a massive way by persisting with this system that's based intrinsically on scarcity and the dynamics that incorporate failure. So again, okay, stru listen, man, structural you, you gotta, violence. You gotta not you got to not just uh, do this uh, filibustering stuff. This is kind of a yes-no thing. Right. So you talk about uh, uh, market uh, corrections or market discipline being a form of, uh, what did you call it, uh, structural violence? It has the propensity and so of if, creating... Uh, if my daughter sets up a lemonade stand and people don't, they drive past, maybe it's not that warm, maybe they just don't feel like lemonade. If nobody buys her lemonade, is she being subjected to structural violence? That's a yes-no question. Please no, don't filibuster not. me because I can't follow what you're saying. No, no, I'm not filibustering that. Of course, that, that's, but that's completely beside the point of what I'm trying to say. It's unfortunate because I'm talking about one very specific wait, wait, thing. Wait, wait, wait. Is it a yes? Is it yes or no? Is I she being subjected to structural violence? I said, of course not. No. And it's explicit. Oh, sorry. I missed I explicit. Missed okay. And it's explicit. So market, market discipline, of the vacuum which that is an action. example of, is not an example of structural violence. Market discipline has many terrible forms of structural violence because it is structurally unnecessary. Market discipline is a is a byproduct of the market system. It is natural to have this efficiency ebb and flow, and therefore there's failure, and therefore there's winning and losing. And in many cases, it doesn't resemble reality whatsoever. The company, again, that went that went bankrupt that I worked for, they suffered market discipline, and it had a horrible effect on the effects of the people around me. Horrible. No, and it no, wasn't no, that no, 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 absolutely yes, yes, not. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely not. Again, you say this, I, I don't know what, what you're doing in terms of processing your experiences as an entrepreneur, but if they were not able to use the scarce resources of the planet in a manner that pleased customers voluntarily, then the business ending freed them up to do something that was no. more productive. Like, I like to sing, but I'm no Freddie Mercury, right? So if I say, well, I'm going to take, uh, you know, $100,000 in a year of my life to produce an album, and nobody wants to buy my album, that's a signal from the market that I'm not really that entertaining or enjoyable to listen to as a singer. And if I were to break into song right now, I think we would both agree <laughs> that that would be quite wise on the part of the market. You so if you are engaged in a particular pursuit and you cannot make it work for whatever reason, you lack the skill set, you lack the, the work ethic, you lack the, uh, the, the technical skills, you lack the people skills, you, for whatever reason, what happens is you are then freed up to do something that is uh, going to be more productive for your time, energy, and you're going to find, and the, the the market is going to basically give you the correct amount of resources that you can handle in a productive way. Uh, so if I was put in charge of Microsoft, I'd probably run it into the ground. I don't know anything about running a giant software sure. company, a small software company, perhaps. I'm sorry that if I and so the you. market would quickly shift me out of that position and shift me into something that would be more productive to my skills and abilities. Market discipline is entirely positive. It's the creative destruction of. I mean, if we didn't have market and discipline, there'd still be horse and buggy manufacturers competing with car companies. So the, the, and for one, you misunderstood the example I was using. I wasn't referring to my, my business as an entrepreneur and the ownership work that I do in that example. I was referring to the company I worked for that went bankrupt. Now, you can say that that market discipline was great for them. It freed up resources. It freed up this and that. But I watched all of these employees suffer extensively. I watched one person almost get evicted from their job, evicted from their home, excuse me. I watched the true face 
of the market system when it comes to the unnecessary inhumanity. And when I argue for a new economy, it removes the entire edifice of what you speak of with the fundamental premise that we have the technical capacity to not have to endure this type of suffering that is deeply unnecessary because of things like market correction and invariably and this is what, you know, I mean, Peter, you're, a, you're a great talker, but I got to tell you, it's incredibly frustrating to talk to you because we went over this at the very Likewise. beginning. You talked, about, uh, you talked about three things to do with your, uh, the, the business that was failing. First of all, everybody decided to stay on with the business, even though you said you weren't being paid for months. That's a choice. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly great choice, and I certainly right. don't relish anybody being put Actually, in that position. It's pretty horrible. Another, but we talked could, about you talked about somebody being subject job. to a government visa. You talked about uh, bankruptcy, not being able to get your money. And I talked about corporations. And visa, bankruptcy, and corporations have nothing to do with the market system, but are entirely state-generated stuff. And now, as if we'd never had that conversation, you are now talking about this as being a perfect example of the free market. It's like you don't have an input, you only have an output. Well, that's funny. That's a funny point. See, what you just did was rephrase everything I just said, recategorized my entire argument, because I'm not talking about the state interference, because that's actually not the point. That's not the relevant issue. You can remove the visa issue if you really want to re refer to that as a state issue. You can remove all the elements Wait, of the I state. if I really want to refer to it, is it, is it not it's a not, government law that you need a visa to work? It is obviously a government law, but there are economic okay, so reasons why Okay, so don't refer to it as exist. something that I'm just insisting on, like it's some arbitrary whim of mine, like I like jazz, and you have to as well. I'm but not, to I'm talk not. about facts here. Yes, we are, absolutely. And what I, what I was referring to within this discussion, within the original discussion, was the fact that state influence of whatever issues aside, because it's, it's a moot issue to me because I look at everything the state does as, as an economic institution. But I'm not even going to argue that with you since you're just going to keep doing what you're doing and it's obviously not going to end up with any type of solution. So let's just agree to disagree on that one. My issue comes down <laughs> no, to the I fact that No, I don't agree to disagree, structure. but go ahead. Fine. My issue I think that's a complete cop out. I think that's somebody who rejects reason and evidence, no. just saying, "Well, let's just agree to disagree," as no, if I'm some crazy have, guy who doesn't enormous, take reason and evidence. All, I'm, I have an I enormous amount that I want to cover for the sake of your audience, because you know, a this is really what this is about: is coercive exchange. Point being is that my original point, okay, is about how the corrective mechanisms that are built into the system have very negative consequences unnecessarily because they don't need to exist. So the people that were almost evicted, the people that lost their jobs, the people that, just like myself, were put in a deep financial situation because of the natural ebb and flow of market correction. You can talk about how we might have eventually adapted, we can talk about all the things, but a great deal of suffering occurs when these things happen. And with with the entire spectrum of a self-interest driven system, which is exactly the kind of thing that you want to get away from, the scarcity driven self-interest, with the entire spectrum of this, you easy to lose sight in economic theory about what's actually happening on a daily basis. And, you know, it, it's frustrating because I'm trying to encounter so many different things that you keep bringing up. And I, I keep losing my holistic point because it's it's you, it's a deviation from the broad Well, no, this view. is a conversation, not a monologue, I, uh, right? Uh, but absolutely. let me ask you a question. This is sort of – this is not an economics question. This is just sort of a personal question. Indulge sure. me if, if you don't mind. You don't have to answer sure. it. But let's say that that video production company had done really well and you had stayed there. Uh, it, it seems less than likely – that you would have ended up as, I think, the very talented, skilled, and, and effective filmmaker that you are, and, and agitator and polemicist, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but somebody who's a gadfly in society and who puts forward provocative, interesting, and I think very important questions. Okay. I would you rather be doing what you're doing now, or would you rather still be working at the video production company? No one can say where the corrections, so to speak, will push somebody in a particular direction. I could have gone on to do better things. Others might have gone straight down the tube. I again, it's there's no, it's not really an argument because it can go many different directions based on a life experience. What happens to people? Just and, thought, but, and if yeah. and if and if you if you put it in the context in the broad again, which I always take the broad view of what's actually happening in the world with. One person dying every three seconds unnecessarily with tremendous imbalance, with a public health crisis that's off the charts on the planet. There's a great deal to argue against that the vast majority of people are actually doing better over time. I don't think that's the case. I think uh, it's very clear that we are in decline, as my series denotes. So I agree with your point, Stefan. I actually entirely agree with the, and I don't mean to be condescending when I do this, the box that you describe. Uh, the market eco market economy working in your idealistic idealized I'm gonna, I'm gonna state. I'm going to think of it as a flower box. 
Good. <laughs> Go on. I, but I'm looking again at what's actually happening in, in the world. I'm looking at the market. No, as I'm, what... I'm not looking at what's actually happening in the world. I, I try not to deal with the real world or facts at all. I just, you see the way you keep reframing well, this kind I, of stuff. Well, I agree with that little box that you're in, but I'm trying to deal with the real world. It's like, uh, I'm and I'm at, not. I'm looking. I'm sorry if it sounds like that. I'm looking at the exact statistical large-scale outcome, which I don't think is taken into account in the arguments that you've presented. That's all. I mean, you can talk about the specifics of two sorry, which people. which large scale which sorry which large scale statistical outcomes am I not taking taking uh, broad account? Broad public broad public health and ecological sustainability are the true economic factors in our world, and those things which are considered externalities with respect to the market are not given as much attention by market theorists that talk about tons of great intellectual things and the inner workings of the system and how it should work and what's interfering with its process, such as the state. But when I look at what's actually happening when I just I look at these theories, okay, well, this is how it's supposed to work, but I look at what the world is actually doing, and I draw the train of thought from the fact that the market economy is built directly into this, to power coercion and this idea of the state. When I examine this train of thought, I end up with the same conclusions, and that's the fact. Well, that I mean, just, you- just very briefly, I mean, my sort of, sort of background in the entrepreneurial world was in the field of environmentalism, so I have 10 plus years uh, in the area. And again, I don't claim to have any monopoly on answers in this way, but um, uh, it seems to me that the the market answer to ecological sustainability, which I agree with you, is an absolutely essential topic to be dealt with, uh, is to try and move as many uh, goods and services and and, um, land and resources into uh, the hands of owners as possible, because owners like to take care of their stuff, and uh, governments don't really care about their stuff. That's sort of a basic reality of, of, of life. And so if you move resources into private hands, then people really care about them getting polluted and people really care about them getting wasted. And so, uh, for instance, like in in Canada here, uh, on the East Coast in Newfoundland, there's this cod industry. And and when the first settlers came to Canada uh, 400 years ago, they wrote that the cod was so plentiful, it felt like you could walk from your ship to to the shore, They like there were so many cod. And this industry lasted for almost 400 years when there was almost no government interference. Why? Because the fishermen didn't want to deplete the fish stock for next year. So they all had very, very strict controls that were voluntarily put forward. Like if you lived in the village, you you couldn't fish more or people wouldn't want to talk to you or didn't have anything to do with you. And so they managed to, in a non-government environment, they managed to maintain this resource and have it still teeming and plentiful and, and valuable and useful for like 400 years. And then uh, the government took over the quota system for the fish. And within about five to seven years, uh, the fish were completely gone and have never returned. One of the great resources uh, in the world uh, in terms of helping to feed the people that you and I both desperately want to feed to keep the price of a very nutritious and healthy food down was completely destroyed by the government. The government raised the quotas and the government subsidized the fishermen because they wanted to get votes. And uh, the fishermen said, well, it's not up to us anymore. I'm sure those scientists in the government know what they're doing. And the okay. fish was a complete, and this is just one example of many. Uh, of course, one a, of the greatest environmental disasters that occurred was the Soviet Union itself. I'm not saying that you're into Marxism or anything, but the Soviet Union was incredibly destructive because nobody actually owned the resources. It seems, historically, if you kind of look at stuff, and it's not a perfect, uh, 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 I think, one-to-one ratio, but there's a very strong trend that the best way to protect resources is to get them into the hands of interested owners as quickly as possible. That's why you and I don't change the oil on a rental car, because it's not ours. You get uh, resources into the hands of private as soon as possible, and you let the price mechanism raise the prices of things which become scarce so that people either reduce their use or find alternatives, which, of course, keeps things from getting depleted to to inexorably. So this is very brief, and I, you know, it's okay. not flinch or anything like that, I but those are two a, things that I would suggest. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think that's a wonderfully ethically oriented anecdotal case that says that maybe people that own things sometimes treat them treat resources very well but in the structural mechanism of the market where it's based on resource exploitation where it's where the, the invariably the earth is looked upon as a source of profit and wealth because that's exactly what the market mechanism creates that's that's the proxy of all of all industrial behavior someone can want to take care of things but it's an externality and i think that's a serious problem when i do 
examine all of the topsoil water problems, pollution problems. The vast majority of this, these issues come from private corporations that are basically just exhausting as fast as they can for the sake of their and own do self-interest. And do they own the resource and the environment which they're exploiting? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It, it's, there's a, it, it doesn't really matter as much. If you look at, say, topsoil problems, you have a, a, a chain of, of issues that come into play with the depletion of topsoil that uh, can be both related to the owner of that piece of land or the industry that is supporting the agricultural development, which, as you should know, is very insidious because they're trying to maximize as much as they can the cheapest possible way. And Within but that agriculture, ethic, sorry to interrupt, but agriculture throughout the world is so unbelievably distorted by status incentives. I mean, farm policy is just sure. monstrous throughout the West in particular. I mean, you know, these lakes of wine and mountains of butter over in France and the massive amount of uh, overproduction uh, of food that is heavily subsidized by farm subsidies in the U.S., the products of which are then dumped over in the third world, which destroys local farming and creates intense dependence on government and so on. I don't think that you can really point to farms as a really great example of non-status free market uh, activity. Well, uh, once again, and I know we disagree on this point, I don't look at the state as anything more than an extension of special interests within the market economy. So It's like, it's like how feminists look at lovemaking, that all lovemaking is rape, and rape is just an extension of lovemaking. Anyway, but go no, on. No, it's, it's not at all like that. If you don't have a structural incentive built into the process of industrial production and recycling and everything that goes into our industrial system from top to bottom. If you're not actually, if you don't have a structural incentive, excuse me, of maintaining ecological balance in a steady state referent, meaning you have to actually be in accord with everything, dynamic equilibrium. Nothing right now is in dynamic equilibrium on this planet from rainforest depletion to a whole list of things that I could speak of. If it's not structurally in the system, then it's not going to manifest. And as I said with my first fallacy, you can't expect these moral impositions to persevere in the wake of a system that is basically predicated on the exact opposite incentive system. It doesn't know that because it's a crazy system. It's a, it's a schizophrenic, insane system that doesn't even know what it's doing because it's using a proxy. People don't think about any of these things. They don't think about the exploitation and abuse both on the, on the public health level or the ecological level, but it happens over time, which is why, again, in the, in the real life trends, I'm not meaning it's condescending, you see the patterns that you do. And no, you cannot dismiss this all on state interference, nor can you remove the market from the state. No, but I, I can take examples that you bring up. So you talk about rainforest depletion, which I, I think is, is horrendous. Um, who, who owns the rainforests? Who is, who is uh, selling the rainforests? Who, came, who claims care, custody, and control over the rainforests? Well, in certain instances, it might be the state. In certain instances, it might be private corporations. But again, they're the same thing. Um, no, no. See, governments, governments claim to own all land. Pretty much, as you know, a third of the land in America is directly owned by the federal government. Governments in general claim to own all resources and then may then provide them to, uh, to private companies. I know out here in Canada, there's a big problem in that the government will only sell logging rights, not actual land rights. And so what they do is they go in and they clear cut because they don't actually own the land. Uh, and they only own the trees, so they come in and they can't buy the land, they can only buy the logging rights. And whereas in America, where you can actually uh, buy the land, then the person who can bid the most for that resource is the person who can make the most long-term efficient use of it, which means somebody who's going to replant the trees and so on. So um, I believe, okay. and again, I'm, I don't have a clear answer in every, uh, every um, uh, country, but the rainforest is owned uh, by the governments, and I believe that they're leased down. Of course, governments want to make as much money as quickly as possible because that boosts GDP, that makes people jobs. Governments, both through their inflationary policies of printing money and through just wanting to jack up resource consumption in order to drive GDP, in order to drive job creation and make everybody want to vote them back in are incredibly short-sighted when it comes to long-term economic sustainability, which is why, to me, central authority is really the opposite of sustainability. I agree it's short-sighted, but I see that, again, I don't, I don't split hairs with, this, with what you're splitting. I don't, it doesn't matter who owns it, necessarily. It matters what the process is and what the dynamics of the economic manifold is, how it's engaged, what the needs are, what is necessary to keep a profit going and keep cyclical consumption happening. If you break down this system, we can remove all of the components of entrepreneurship and all of these little fragments that exist in the arguments 
propagated in the endless textbooks. There's only three players in the in the in the global economy. There's the consumer, there is the owners, and there are the laborers. And there's they're interchangeable at, at at times. Obviously, everyone's a consumer. The only thing that keeps this system afloat is the constant and perpetual consumption of goods. I think that's a it's a, sim, a simple idea that many people forget. And that's why you have to have these these elements of growth where you have to get more people employed, you need more circulation. The true underlying mechanism of the economy is this constant and what I would decree as hideously wasteful necessity to keep money and keep services and keep people just doing shit over and over and over again no matter what they're even doing. I would say that 85% and it might be a little gratuitous, but depending on technological trends right now, I'd say at least 75% of the most occupations are relevant in the world today. They're not necessary. They're a waste of time when it comes to satisfying global public health needs and maintaining ecological balance, which is what the whole point of an economy is and what the whole point of technical efficiency is. So in my view, to come back to the point, I don't see how the system of market economics is compatible with general technical, social sustainability, or ecological sustainability, because it doesn't take such issues into direct account structurally. It depends on an imposed moral structure, and by extension, an inevitable legal structure. All the relevant you know, issues pertaining to increased technical efficiency, public health, and sustainability are considered externalities. Okay, so sorry, I just wanted to understand what you said. So what you said, the, the, the three major economic actors are owners, consumers, and... Owners, consumers, and laborers. Consumers and laborers. Laborers. Sorry, I uh, I used my regular um, supernova chicken scratch to write that down. Oh, so sorry. owners, consumers, and laborers. Uh, would you not consider to be to, for governments to be economic actors? They are, of course, the single greatest economic actor in every Western economy. I consider government to be a variation of owners. Okay, so the owner, like somebody who starts a company, is the same as somebody who starts a war. No, that's that's apples and oranges. The, uh, every so mechanism, they're not the same. No, uh, well, it depends on how you define violence. Then, well, war is one manifestation. National war is one manifestation of violence and invariably coercion. Coercion in many ways, and there are it, the entire basis of market dynamic is based on essentially the same type of ethic. It's a war system. The entire basis of you, multiple, I mean, just, I'm just multiple curious. cell phone I mean, because companies, I'm, I'm, the I'm entire always, basis, let me sorry, finish the point. The entire basis yeah, yeah. of competition, say multiple cell phone companies existing at once, creating enormous waste, uh, creating multiplicity of goods that are unnecessary, holding proprietary knowledge that should be shared to create the best possible efficiency and assess the best possible demand for the population. Instead, they separate themselves out and they battle for market share with little slight improvements and it's a it's a warring mentality it might be very civil it might be like muskets and they're walking right towards them and they're speaking in very cogent language but it's still a war system no matter what face you paint it so but don't you feel i mean sorry don't you feel just a little absurd and i don't mean to i mean to genuinely i genuinely want to know if if you're sure. comparing somebody like George Bush, uh, who started this unbelievably murderous uh, war in, in Iraq, which has genetically destroyed half the population where you've got in Fallujah, uh, half the babies being born with birth defects, which has caused the deaths of over a million people and almost two million people have fled a I completely know. shattered, destroyed and irradiated country. Do you really feel comfortable putting those that that kind of sociopathic mass murderer in the same moral category as somebody who starts a convenience store. Uh, well, it's not someone who starts a convenience store per se. It's the act of actual competition against others. You could theoretically have one convenience store in a town that has only a very small population. That's all they ever need. It would have a natural monopoly. I, I look at the, the denial of principle continuum as throughout. In other words, in many ways, when I look at it's obviously there's an element of basic moral ethics. I'm not trying to deny that there isn't at some point somebody somewhere isn't going to draw the line based on their development. And on average, most in this culture have a very, very grand sense of ethics, but they're unfortunately forced into unethical behavior by the market. Do I differentiate in absolute principle? Not really. I really don't. Because if you're in a warring system for resources and acquisition, if you're predicated once again on scarcity and the need to to make sure you secure your power and security, which becomes super neurotic as people get more and more wealthy because they want more and more, and I won't even go on the psychological neuroses of the, the fear-based power neuroses that is, that is so prevalent, but that is in, in the exact case of George Bush, uh, his constituents and what they do because they want more and more and more for the industries that they represent. 
even though it's unnecessary because they already have their actual needs met, that's a part of a different uh, neurotic problem. But no, there, there is principally no difference between the two examples that I've given. So we should have, like, in a free society, I guess we would have war crimes trials for people who start wars that result in the deaths of millions of people and for, like, Apu from The Simpsons for running a convenience store. And this doesn't but, seem absurd to you? Uh, the way you describe it in the context of the way that we have been culturally conditioned to think about violence. You know, we look at 9-11, 3,000 people die. You know how many people die every day because of poverty in the United States unnecessarily? We but look not at, because we, of convenience store owners. That's what I'm saying. I... But the ethic that underlies the survival mechanism inherent to the system, as I've denoted about a thousand times in this delusion, this, this continuum fallacy that persists, where we try to oh, differentiate, where we, where we differentiate between different types of aggression, where one, yes, we might be culturally conditioned to see is absolutely atrocious, but we don't realize how equally is atrocious, but yet soft other forms of violence are. And again, I strongly suggest you look into structural violence and its causes because there's a the wave of violence that, that goes way, way beyond uh, what we consider to be behavioral violence. Structural violence has killed more people on this planet in the past 50 years than most bass murderers, than most dictators. Uh, this isn't me speaking, by the way. These are, these are well-acknowledged public health officials who have come to terms with this very issue. Now, if you want to say that it's all because of the state, that's that's something I don't agree with. If you want to say that, well, you know, I, I don't want to keep deviating because we're going to run out of time here. So I, I if there's, why don't you finish up with anything that you'd like to say, uh, and then let me uh, let me try to speak to the rest of what I had here. Uh, Unless you just want me to keep going. I don't want to interrupt you, though. If you have a train of thought that you have right now, my friend, go ahead and say it. But there no, are I other guess things. I'll, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to put in a, uh, uh, a concluding statement. Um, well, I'm not ending uh, it. I have other things. Democide. I I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm not trying to end the conversation yet. I can go for about 20 more minutes, but I, but, uh, I just want to make sure I don't cut you off. I just have other issues that I think are important to point out. Uh, okay. Well, I think let's, let's do closings. Um, I think I think my basic um, the, only, the only basic thing that I want to say is that I mean yes it would be fantastic if we could deal with uh, public health issues you know the, the 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 amount of illness that can be cured by you know pennies worth of medicine is is incredibly frustrating and I'm sure you do Peter and I do the charitable work that is necessary to get the kind of help out to the people who need it it is desperately tragic uh, the third world uh, problems are are savage uh, they of course result from a wide variety of factors uh, there is the history of imperialism which is an entirely state driven activity uh, foreign aid which is a state driven activity uh, is is absolutely absolutely wretched uh, in terms of giving money and weapons to third world leaders. Uh, the, 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 the global arms sale, which is a state-based activity, see if you can stop spot a pattern here, the, the global arms trade, which arms despots and warlords in the most savage and destructive manner, uh, the food trade, and it's not even trade, the, the mass subsidizing and, and food dumping of crops in third world markets, destroying local economies, the trade barriers. If you really want to close the gaps of inequality, you open your trade barriers and then people go and bid up the prices of the workers who make the least and then they bid down the prices of the work who make the most and then we end up with some sort of egalitarianism that generally slowly rises over time. That's sort of the historical example where trade tends to be the freest. I don't want uh, the government to use force to take or print or borrow money and send it to despots along with cratefuls of weapons to third world dictators. Uh, what I do want is to be able to freely trade and I think that people in Africa and, and other despoiled countries can do fantastically in competing with the West and there is a, is a book called The White Man's Burden that goes into great detail about how absolutely wretched the arms trade and foreign aid and uh, agricultural subsidy dumping has been on the third world. So these are all government activities could never occur in the free market. In the free market, what you'd have is charity and trade. That's what the free market generally runs on. Uh, even in the depths of the recession, hundreds of billions of dollars are given every year uh, in charity, even when there's a welfare state, even when there's high taxation and so on. So, mm -hmm. so my, uh, yeah, I really do want to see the gap closing and it has not escaped the notice of myself or any other astute observers that as government power has grown, inequality has always grown because when government power grows, rich people want to use it more to enhance their own power uh, and prestige and, and incomes, of course. 
And so, like, for instance, uh, after the Second World War, before the welfare state came in in any fundamental way, uh, poverty was, was declining by about 1% a year. And then when the, under LBJ, when the Great Society programs, the welfare state programs came in, uh, poverty stalled. It's been rising slowly ever since. And we have a near permanent underclass of undereducated, underutilized, tragically uh, crippled uh, people in society. And uh, this is not how society should be. I do share... Uh, I think Peter's in intense exasperation at, at how many resources we as, you know, the genius monkeys can produce and provide in the world. I mean, whether it's through charity or through trade, as long as it's peaceful, then I think it's virtuous and sustainable. It is incredibly frustrating to see how much money gets wasted and how much bullshit economy there is, you know, derivatives uh, uh, market being many times the world's GDP. I mean, this is all insanity. And it's fundamentally driven by government's control of interest rates, banking, and money. And so for me, um, no matter how complex the symptoms are, you know, there's lots of people who trip and fall all over the world. You don't need to study every particular example as to figure out what went wrong. All you need to say is there's this thing called gravity, which we have to take account of. And there's lots of disasters throughout the world. And what I do uh, as a philosopher is I have to go down to first principles. First principles are what are the ethics that uh, are being violated that produce these kinds of disasters. Now, it's not like every disaster in life is the result of an ethical violation. Sometimes you just think the screen, you think the door is open, the glass door is open when it's not and you bump your nose. But where fundamental and repetitive and ever escalating catastrophes are occurring, need to look for the moral uh, violations that occur right down at the root of things. And the, the two areas that I tend to focus on are the state, which is the most uh, concentrated uh, and violent uh, expression of violations of the non-aggression principle through taxation, through regulation, through debt, through monopolies, that get through war, through imprisonment. I mean, we haven't even talked about the prison industrial complex, which again is an entirely state paid for and state driven enterprise and occupation. Governments control education, they control water, they control air, they control land, they control businesses, they control banking, they claim to regulate everything under the sun, they control war, military, police, law courts, navies, air forces, nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, you name it. Uh, health and safety standards, for want of a better phrase, the governments control so much that whenever you're going to look for a problem in society, it definitely is the first place to look. It may not be the only place to look, but you could probably spend a lifetime looking and not be done. And the second place, which is, I think, where I really do want people to get the most, at least out of my side of the conversation tonight, is the most fundamental violation of the non-aggression principle, which we can control, is our aggression against children. Spanking, for instance, which is still practiced by 80 to 90 percent of American households, is a clear violation of the non-aggression principle. Spanking is not self-defense. Spanking is the initiation of force against a biological prisoner who happens okay. to be in your home, who never choose, chose you as a parent, and who simply cannot escape. If you hit your wife, she can actually press charges, and she can leave and go to a shelter and get help. If you hit your child in the U.S., there's not even any legal recourse. There's nothing that that child can do. It is a clear violation of the non-aggression principle, as is confinement, abandoning, and verbal threats, and, of course, sexual and physical abuse and so on, even as an escalation from the legal spanking. If we want to get something out of philosophy, um, railing against the Fed, which I know Peter and I both do, uh, railing against corruption, railing against waste, which we both do, uh, I think is important. But I think what can what people can actually do, we can't end the Fed. We can't end this uh, horrible system that is uh, eating our young. What we can do is within our own life say, well, if the non-aggression principle is valid and if it's not, then we should stop teaching it to our children. You know, don't hit, don't steal, don't push. If it is valid, then let's put it into practice in our own homes. Let's reject the use of aggression in the raising of our own children. And scientifically and statistically, we will then produce a kind of different human being. Uh, human beings are fairly easy to engineer. You know, if you want to make a sociopath, there are particular steps that you need to make. If you want to make a wise, kind, and gentle person, there are other particular steps that you need to take. This has all been very well established scientifically over the last 30 or 40 years, in particular in the last 15 to 20 years. Let's just make that commitment as a species to stop using aggression against the raising of children. I think that what will result out of that is a paradise that's beyond even Peter and I's wild imagination of how great okay. the world can be. It's something that we can actually do in a principled manner to change the world irrevocably because once you break that cycle of abuse, it never, ever really seems to start up again. So that's it for me for my little rant. Okay, uh, Peter, I'll certainly leave you with the last word. That's absolutely uh, brilliant points. I couldn't agree more and I identify greatly with your values and your observations. And I'll leave the audience and yourself with some basic summary conclusions here. And we'll probably have to do this again if you want me to actually talk about 
the price mechanism issue and what a resource-based economic model actually entails since we didn't get that far. But I think it's actually great as a preliminary discussion that we go through these issues. The point I would make, first of all, is that this concept that the state is the evil enemy of humanity, that with if we could just get rid of the conditions that create this state entity, or actually I should say we just get rid of the state, that things will be much better and we can allow the market to do what it needs to do. I think there's actually a great deal of truth to that, but I cannot escape the firm reality of the historical re historical development, excuse me, of the state and why it exists to begin with, which is I can't find any defense against an extension of basic market principles. Market principles which come from which come from an assumption of scarcity and it come from a Malthusian notion that there are going to be winners and losers, there is going to be poverty, and all of the traditional economic things that are up under there in fine print that you will find that has had tremendous influence on the value systems of people, not to mention, again, are inherently st are structurally inherent to the market concept itself of trade and seeking advantage and competition and self-interest. So I, we can... We can talk more about that. I can't find any argument that you've pointed out that leads me to believe that the state is just a horrible manifestation. I understand that people will run to the state for power consolidation, but if there's an interest already for people to want power consolidation because of the structural psychological values inherent in the market, then I, I don't see how you can possibly defend against its development in one form or another, meaning development of some type of coercion, inevitable coercion of one person against another outside of the game board that we like to think exists in the market when in fact there are no ends when it comes to the position of human survival. And the more you back someone in a corner, as this system does very, very often on a daily basis, especially through structural violence, the more corrupt they probably become. And it's not really corruption at all. It's just the way it is. It's just the psychology inherent. The non-aggression principle, voluntarism and coercion, I still would sta state that within the confines of the way you describe them, I absolutely agree and I identify entirely. But when you break down what these terms actually mean and imply, they're far too narrow and short-sighted to be applicable to be empirically relevant. Mainly because when we see what the structural violence of our system does, when we see when people are broke and they're coerced, by the very structural system into certain acts that they do not want to do for the sake of survival, for the sake of their children. Again, I'm sure you think that the state is probably the cause of all of that too, but I think it's inherent. These terms are non-applicable. If you really want to care about human life, then you need to make the necessities of life available to all without a price tag and without the need to compete. Structural violence is the leading cause of death and public health problems in the world today, and it is not related to the state. You can take a statistical analysis of state control around the world in a traditional sense, and you will find that those that have the most regulation of their economies are the ones with the least amount of social inequality. And with respect to the final point on human development, we cannot be narrow enough to think that just because that parents are the starting point of development. My mother worked for social services in North Carolina, child protective services. I grew up in an environment listening to her stories for a decade about the horrors of the poverty in rural North Carolina. You cannot stop generations of child abuse. There is such a deeply synergistic attribute. Our social nature has such powerful pressures that go largely ignored, unfortunately, that human development has to be given a social context. You have to give people what they need. And in the past, we were not able to do that, but we can now. We can meet the needs of every human being on earth to give that true security that people want and feel. So, so child development, so people have to look at their parents and see them struggling for money and develop this instant adaptation that they think they, they have to be concerned about money. They have to be fearful. The, the father that comes home from work that has just gotten fired, that's full of aggression, that can't help due to his own pressures, lash out as every human being inevitably will because lashing out and release is an inevitable part of primate, primate patterns. It's, you can see it in all primate species. So it, these patterns and pressures are what needs to be talked about if we're going to get to the bottom of true public health and ecological sustainability. So I can't emphasize enough the need to recognize the system consequence. And I don't agree with this system because it's creating violence on a scale that is wholly unnecessary 
and uh, it's truly tragic. So I suggest that we come back after this conversation, since I know we disagree, but I can come back and I can speak about what a resource-based economic model actually entails, how it's not a centrally planned system, and the technology that underpins it that can actually allow a completely democratic process, overcome the means of production problem that's put forward by Mises and the like, Mises and the like. Uh, I think that would be for a great future conversation. And Stefan, I appreciate you having me.